Hi and welcome to the presentation Learning from the Pandemic Pandemonium, Hubs as the Hidden Catalysts in Supply Chain Networks. I'm Matthias Platzer, I'm the Practice Director for Java Logistics in Europe from Westernacher. Um, this presentation will be actually in three parts. So first of all, we will go into the supply chain theory and learn about the hub and spoke model, just to get a definition of hubs. Then we will apply this theory to practice by the example of the North American uh, multimodal corridor. And thirdly, this is the last section, then we will learn about how the, the crisis, the COVID crisis in 2021 and 2022 uh, interrupted the operations in the supply chain networks, especially on hubs and how the hubs became the bottlenecks in the supply chain network. So then let's start with some theory. First of all, the hub and spoke model. We got a spoke here. A spoke is a transportation. This is a movement of goods between a start and an end point. It's actually a mean of transportation traveling on this lane. Yeah. And this uh, equals then a an, um, an start point and an end point and the spoke in between. Um, so actually two connections, A to B and B to A. And of course, when we uh, triple this, we would have A to F as the end points and three spokes in between would equal then six connections, A to B, B to A, C to D, and so on and so on. If we now introduce a hub to this model, yeah, a hub would be, in definition, uh, a side place where a transshipment of cargo, a handover of cargo, a transfer of cargo is taking place. If we install this in our network here, we would actually um, yeah, increase the number of connections. So as you see here, um, first of all, from each and every end point, yeah, from each and every start point, we could um, directly reach five different endpoints, which equals then 30 connections. But the hub itself can also be seen as a point, so meaning 12 more connections to and from the hub. And this would then get in total to 42 connections. So you see, just by installing one little hub in there, yeah, uh, you actually increase your connections, your offered connections by a lot. But of course, um, yeah, practice is not always like theory. Um, in reality, um, the hub and spoke model is of course not that neat and organized and um, all this, this structured. It is of course driven by uh, geographical um, borders, by topographical um, circumstances. So it's a little bit mixed up and scrambled, like you see in this picture. This example now applied to uh, the, the United States would be seen as the multimodal corridor. We see the Port of Los Angeles as the first hub on the West Coast down south. We see Chicago as another hub uh, nearly to the East Coast. We see the spokes, the oversea connections, yeah. Uh, to Asia, for example, we see the spokes on the eastern part to the east coast then from Chicago or some other overseas connections to Europe or to Canada, actually. Uh, and we see the land bridge in here. This is the main, um, the main spoke in the United States um, with two hubs in between. So going from Port of Los Angeles via Sacramento and Denver to Chicago. To give you some impressions on what we are talking about in these two hubs. So this is a map of the Port of Los Angeles. So you see a massive uh, compound yeah, of a terminal for container operations. This is an impression of the gantry grains used there. So these gantry grains are not used for the transshipment of containers. This is used for the storage of containers. So all these different lanes, all these different um, stacks in here are just for storing of empty or full containers. This is, as you see here, the container grains directly to discharge from the vessel, to load the vessel. So actually beautiful port area here. And not only the vessel transportation, of course, this is now the multimodal uh, area of Port of Los Angeles, uh, seeing the, the railroad tracks and of course the, the truck lanes for road transportation, for onward transportation near Los Angeles. Um, this is the land bridge. This is the railroad transportation between Port of Los Angeles and Chicago. And as you see, the railroads, um, the container uh, trains here are 
double stack. Yeah, so this is unique in North America uh, and India, in parts of India where you can do this. Um, in all the other parts of the world, it uh, would be just one container here. We have this beautiful double stack. Second example here, uh, somewhere in the land bridge um, around uh, Colorado here. And of course, Chicago. Chicago is more themed than uh, like a multimodal hub. Um, also, vessel operations, but um, the main focus is then on the Landsat uh, operation, actually. Okay, before we are going into the next chapter about um, the impacts that we faced or that we saw yeah, in 2021 and 2022, first of all, we need to explore what were the root causes for these impacts, for these disruptions. So first of all, we had an increased container volume from Asia to the US. This is due, or this was due to a minimal supply during the COVID crisis. And as you see on the right-hand side, this is another theory uh, in, in the supply chain theory, actually, the bullwhip effect, yeah? So um, when um, the demand is um, changed, yeah, at some stage, of course, we have like this bullwhip effect in the other stages, um, this, um, this bullwhip effect in the supply drop uh, and increase, yeah? And on the other side also, in the stock levels in the different stages. But I will not go into any further details. Um, you should know about this already. Otherwise, um, I think just a Google search will do. Um, the second uh, root cause for the impacts were a shortage of port workers due to layoffs before, yeah, during uh, the time of minimized operations, actually, and uh, due to quarantines yeah, of the workers. And the third root cause were a slowed down pickup of containers in the terminals due to driver shortages yeah, uh, of shippers and receivers. So this were actually this was the, the third cause of this. What did it lead to? Yeah, first of all, we had more inbound than outbound containers in both hubs in Los Angeles and Chicago. And this led to clogged terminals. Uh, there was an increased handling and turnaround time for containers and trucks. And we would see overloaded storages, massively overloaded storage areas. Going to the, to the next here, um, just to, to have this summarized, we saw actually just minor impacts on the spokes. So they were functioning perfectly fine. They were operating with minor problems. So driver shortages, of course, but um, that, did, that didn't affect uh, too much the railroad transportation or the vessel transportation. But we saw these clocked terminals, yeah? so the hubs became actually the bottleneck of the supply chain network. And yeah, let's do a focused view on the problems. First of all, uh, we saw exceeded storage areas throughout the terminals and even in the buffer areas yeah, in the terminals. And secondly, uh, we saw even before the crisis inefficient routines and procedures but in combination now with limited workforce resulted in total chaos. And this was in the area of the arrival, check-in and handling of trucks and in the picking and handover of containers. So more inbound and outbound containers led to containers pile up throughout the terminals and even in the buffer areas. So you see on the right-hand side, a picture um, taken during this crisis in Chicago. This is from uh, the Trains magazine. It's online available. You see the link here. Uh, where you see uh, that in comparison to the first picture that we saw with the gantry cranes, this gantry crane was actually used before to uh, load, to discharge and load on trains. So underneath those containers piled up, the underneath these container stacks, there are actually four different railroad tracks now blocked off completely from the network because those tracks, these railroad tracks were used as buffer areas yeah just to store the containers somewhere this is of course complete madness you block yourself off from, from working so this is a situation that you should prevent by all means which wasn't possible in that time of course um, what were the mentionable action taken just as a relief for the hubs there so uh, mentionable uh, actions on the spokes were the rerouting of intermodal trains on alternative routes just to lengthen the in-transit time. Yeah? So in total, we faced up to 30 different trains parked on route, just awaiting the arrival on the hubs, yeah? 
just to get them out of the hubs, just to have them in transit, have them on the spokes. So uh, we get a little bit more space in the hubs itself. And one of these alternative routes actually were here. So as you see, uh, down south to Texas, then up north to Denver again, and then via Kansas City to Chicago. So this would actually lead to just an increased en route time. Further suggested improvements now. So this was one action that was taken. But of course, with this uh, exceeded storage areas, you need to react also in the system. First of all, yeah, what you need to um, actually have before or install during this um, time of crisis is a very flexible terminal operating system. You need to create those buffer storage areas on the spot in the system. Otherwise, yeah, you lose track of all your containers stored within the terminal. Yeah, you need to continuously log and monitor the container positions. Yeah, um, you need to find your full containers, your booked containers, your empty containers on the spot somewhere in the terminal. This can only uh, be uh, achieved by backed by system backed processes. So you need to keep track of this in a system. If you change in this time of crisis to a paper and pen based process, or if you just lock them in a spreadsheet, for example, um, you wouldn't get your containers out in time. Yeah, that's no way possible. Now focus on the inefficient routines and procedures in combination with the limited workforce. Yeah. So we saw even before the crisis, uh, in the arrival, check-in and handling of trucks. First of all, the trucks would arrive without uh, a pre-planned arrival, without a pre-planned time slot. And we saw there a manual check-in of the trucks. So internal staff was actually needed to check in those trucks. And no external drivers were allowed on site. So this is something very unique. Yeah, this is um, yeah, something that might be based on the infrastructure, but of course, this is something that is actually a disruption to the whole process. And in the picking and handover of containers, yeah, we faced uh, a private or uh, private trailers and chassis were not allowed on site, as said before. So, like the external truck drivers, and internal equipment and stuff used to move the containers to the handover area. So, when seeing down below um, this this process flowchart. Would look like this the manual check in, yeah, where an internal operator needs to check, yeah, whether this truck is allowed on site or not or inside. Uh, this would trigger the container picking. The external truck is then, um, first of all, sent to parking, yeah, and uh, in parallel, uh, after the container picking, uh, the container would be loaded on internal equipment, and the internal equipment would then uh, drive over to the handover area. And in this very case, this would trigger then uh, the drive or the, the, the movement of the external truck to the handover area. In the handover area, there would be the transshipment from the internal equipment to the truck. And after that, a check out of the external truck and a drive back to the picking from the internal equipment. Uh, this is actually uh, then three different disruptions that I see here. Three disruptions, the manual check-in, parking and the transshipment again. And of course, three lifts. First of all, the picking, the loading uh, into the uh, onto the, the internal equipment, the loading of the uh, internal equipment, and loading of the external equipment to the external truck. So three different lifts. And as you see here on the right hand side, you see how it looked like before. So there were open lanes, yeah. And with these inefficient routines, uh, this would result in on the left hand side uh, in this picture. So blocked truck lanes, trucks are piling up, queuing up just to, to get uh, to the check-in, to get then to the handover area, to get to parking and so on. So uh, with this manual check-in, of course, a lot of, uh, of queuing and traffic jams and congestions actually happening. So what would be um, a possibility to resolve this, how to improve the situation? Yeah. So on the left-hand side to arrival check-in and handling of trucks. First of all, you need to install an arrival planning with a time slot booking, with a mandatory time slot booking. Um, a mobile check-in before the actual arrival of the truck and an in-yard routing then later on. Uh, picking of uh, containers and handover of containers, the improvements there 
would be an allowance actually wherever possible for external truck drivers and equipment to enter the premises. And of course, a system guided picking. Yeah. Uh, so actually the picking of the container can be uh, optimized by the system, by uh, an optimizer, just to see whether a certain empty container can be used or a certain um, booked container is uh, at a certain area within um, the container storage area. Yeah, this would actually help you then if you have a system guidance there. So let's see the, um, the flow chart again. Yeah, so we got an arrival planning. So we have an initial idea when a certain truck will arrive. This is very important for the capacity planning within the terminal. So you know, okay, in which times of the day you need more equipment and more internal stuff for the container picking. Then the mobile check-in before the truck actually arrives to the terminal. Yeah. So you would all have you would have already all the necessary data. You don't need to um, stop the truck at the at the gate. As we see here, this would then be an automated gate in. Yeah. Via, for example, license plate detector. So everything is checked before. The mobile check-in also involves uh, like uh, a safety instruction. So the, um, the driver, the excellent truck driver, would already know how to. Um, to uh, behave actually, how to operate within the, the enclosed terminal area. And after that, an in-yard routing. So you need to get in contact with the Exxon truck driver without actually physically talking to him. This can be achieved via an app that the truck driver needs to install on his, in, uh, on his uh, private device or via short message services yeah, directly sent out by a system yeah, to, to the truck driver. The truck would then move to the container loading, yeah, and there shouldn't be a transshipment in between when possible. So meaning from the container picking to the container loading, there is no um, additional disruption. And of course, then the checkout of the loaded truck. This would then lead to zero disruptions within the process. So this is a streamlined approach and only one lift container picking to loading on the external truck. Uh, coming to the end of this presentation, let's recap, let's do a little summary. So we were seeing heavy disruptions uh, in supply chain networks in 2021 and 2022 due to the COVID crisis in 2020. Yeah? And we saw those impacts especially uh, in the operations in hubs. Yeah? Only minor impacts actually on the transportation on spokes, yeah? at least in the example of the North American land bridge. The conclusion now is a very generic conclusion, first of all, the supply chain performance is of course determined by its bottlenecks. Yeah? And in this crisis, hubs actually were the bottlenecks of the supply chain networks and hubs are often nowadays the bottlenecks of the supply chain networks. And to give the gist of this presentation, only system-backed processes and automation will get you to a secure and efficient streamlined operations in hubs and eliminate those most common bottlenecks in supply chain networks. Thank you. We are now at the end. Um, yeah, we from Westernach are always um, happy to help you with your personal situation and we can evaluate, of course, your uh, own bottlenecks in your supply chain network. Please just reach out to me if you have any other questions if you have any other comments on this, or if you do want to have additional information. Thank you.